Ever wonder why you load the boat on one spot, but not the one right next to it? Or why there's never a magic bait or color that always works? Science shows that all bass don't act the same, and that helps explain why we struggle. I've often been amazed out bass fishing how fish found a spot in the first place. You know, it might be a flat, half mile offshore where grass started growing and it hadn't been there for five or ten years, or maybe it's never been out there. And then what about humps and, and high spots and stuff out in the middle of the lakes? Did they follow the bait? Did they go out exploring? And then when you're catching fish, at the same time I wonder, man, I, I'm catching them pretty good, but I wonder if there's something else that works better. And am I catching 5% of the fish that are on this spot, or 30%, or am I catching 95 or 100% of them? Well, this study helps give a few answers and some insight into the mind and personality of bass. This study was peer-reviewed and published in 2012 and done by a, a team of researchers at the University of Illinois. They took a look at the personalities of young bass and wanted to see if the personality trait carried over to all aspects, whether they were more curious, whether they roamed more, whether they were more aggressive, whether they still fed around predators or not. They wanted to see if these traits carried over in all aspects of their life. The researchers thought that young bass were really a particularly interesting study based on a couple of things. One, they were switching what they eat from when they're very young, they eat insects and tiny little plankton, zooplankton, stuff like that, and they start to transfer over eating fish like minnows and small bluegill. The fish are actually more nutrient dense, help them grow faster, whereas the, the plankton, the insects and stuff are more abundant, but not as nutrient dense. And then the other thing is they have a trade-off. When you're small like that, you're both a predator and a prey fish. You're trying to eat as much as you can to grow up as quickly as you can to become bigger than your rivals and also get big enough where a lot of predators can't eat you because when they're tiny, everything can eat them. But at the same time, being aggressive like that, there's a trade-off. The more aggressive you are and don't worry about predators, that increases the chance that you're eaten. So basically, you have to decide what you're gonna eat and how risky you're gonna be to balance out trying to grow really fast versus not get eaten. The bass they use in here, they were they were small ones. They weren't fingerlings, but they were just two to three inch size bass. They're in that transition from eating the insects and larvae going up to the small fish. So these fish, two to three inches, and then they trained them in captivity to eat mosquito larvae. So just tiny little mosquitoes. And then the natural prey that they gave them the option to eat were tiny bluegills, which they're gonna eat in the wild, anywhere from a half inch up to one inch little baby bluegill. For the lab experiment, what they did is they put the bass in tiny little tanks, and then they had a sliding door that went into a much larger tank. And basically what they did is measure how long these fish would just stay in their familiar little tank versus how long did it take them to go out and explore this much bigger tank. They called them explorers versus non-explorers. And then they also introduced a predator. And in this case, bass are cannibals, they use bigger bass. So these are two to three inch bass and they put plexiglass there in some of the situations and the predator was a 10 inch or bigger largemouth, which in the real world would definitely eat those bass. And these bass, even though they were in captivity now, they originally came from an from a actual lake in Illinois. That's where they collected them. So these weren't hatchery raised fish. These are ones that came from an actual lake itself. So they divided these fish into the explorers and non-explorers. The ones that were more homebodies versus the ones that wanted to explore everything. Now the ones that wanted to explore, the explorers, when they would open that gate, within a minute or less, they were out there checking out the new environment, wanted to go check it out. The ones that were non-explorers, the homebodies, it took them like 12 minutes on average to get out of their tiny little chamber. And the interesting thing was they repeated this study time and time again, and the ones that wanted to explore, they would very reliably do it over and over. They were just had the itch. They wanted to get out there and check out the new areas. The ones that were homebodies, the non-explorers, no matter how, how many times they did it, they pretty much stayed at home every single time. Once they had them broken out as explorers and non-explorers, basically the more curious, more aggressive versus less aggressive, less exploring, what they wanted to see is how that affected their feeding. So they gave these fish one at a time the opportunity to eat what was familiar, what they were already eating, those mosquito larvae, 
larvae or they could eat the young bluegill. So they had the option to eat either one. There were equal numbers of them and they were given to them at the same exact time. Now remember, these are fish that are transitioning from eating insects to going to becoming piscivores or, or fish eating. And the fish are more nutrient dense. They help them grow faster and quicker. So they are used to eating these young mosquitoes, but at the same time, there is a reward if you start transitioning to eating fish, that's gonna help you grow faster. And one last thing I should bring up, these fish had not seen young bluegill before. So this is the first time that they ran across them as a prey. But let me put up a chart here and you can see how it broke out for the explorers versus the non-explorers. The explorers in the first category you see, they ate more biomass or more food than the less aggressive non-explorers. Now when you break that down to what they ate, the explorers, you know, the more aggressive, more curious ones, they actually ate more of the mosquitoes than the less curious uh, non-explorers did. And then when you get a look at the bluegill, which they hadn't run into before, they ate a pretty similar amount of bluegill though. And that's where it gets a little interesting. You would expect that the more aggressive, more curious fish would be the ones that were trying to eat more of the bluegill, but they actually were more aggressive and struck way more at mosquitoes, not only strikes, but the amount they ate. Whereas the, the less curious, more cautious, less exploring, non-explorer fish, those ones actually switched what they ate. They were more homebodies, but they took more strikes at bluegill and less at the mosquitoes, and they ate more of their diet was made up of that nutrient-dense uh, bluegill than it was those smaller but more numerous uh, mosquitoes. When you look at that chart, it breaks it down pretty clearly. At the top, it, that's the total biomass, and you see that the explorers on the right ate way, way more total biomass, but that's that middle one, that's the mosquitoes, they ate a ton of those compared to the non-explorers, and the fish biomass, that's where the non-explorers definitely ate more. But then when you go to the next chart here, this is the number of strikes, so it's just not how much they ate, sometimes you don't catch what you're striking at. When you look at the strikes there, the explorers, you see that they're making more strikes total, that top one there, they're pretty aggressively striking. They're, they're going after a bit of everything. Way more strikes on the mosquitoes. The familiar mosquitoes on the left there, that middle chart, the non-explorers not making many strikes on those. When it comes to bluegill, the, uh, the explorers, they're striking more often than the non-explorers. <laughs> they're aggressive. They're trying to hit at them all the time. The non-explorers, they're more cautious, not making as many strikes. But if you go back to the chart before, they're taking a few less strikes but the amount of fish they're, they're eating, the amount of bluegill they're eating, is fairly close to what the explorers are. So basically, the explorers, the aggressive ones, they're, they're trying to eat a little bit of everything, whereas the more cautious ones, they don't strike as much, but when they strike, it seems like they're actually getting their food. They wanted to up the ante on this and then see if they put predators behind plexiglass right on the other side of the prey there, what would happen with the aggressive explorer fish versus the more cautious ones? And again, they put that large mouth, the, the big large mouth on the other side of the plexiglass. Well, what happened was basically none of the fish ate at all. And they had fasted these fish, so they hadn't eaten for a while, so they were gonna be hungry. But when they look and saw that largemouth on the other side, basically they didn't feed at all. They totally shut down both the aggressive ones and the non-aggressive ones. Now the researchers did note maybe this was a flaw, the study here, the fact that none of the fish, there were, I think there were two fish, two of those baby bass in the total study that tried to even make one strike while the predator was out there. They said basically it might've been too big of a predator, it was too close or something. The risk reward was just, it was too much on the risk side. So they really couldn't see that. But what did come out was the personality traits carried through on some of the other attributes, but they weren't necessarily consistent across all the variables. So a fish that was aggressive in one behavior wasn't necessarily aggressive in all the other behaviors. Now the researchers theorized a bit that the fish that were less curious than non-explorers may be looking at the risk or reward or the payoff of moving around or eating certain things versus other, look at, looking at the world through how much is my expenditure or my burning energy gonna pay off. So roaming around, 
you know, that's burning a lot of energy just to do it. Uh, eating these small mosquito versus the, the big bluegill, what's my biggest payoff? So those fish may be less aggressive, might not be willy-nilly, but they're looking at the world through the lens of what's going to give me the best payoff. I'm not going to burn energy unless it's going to give me a payoff. Roaming around, that's burning energy. Le eating these little mosquito, not giving me as much of a payoff as eating these bigger fish. The researchers also noted for implications for stocking bass, you know, a lot of places they take hatchery rate raised uh, largemouth where they spawn bass in captivity or they take uh, Florida strain bass and they raise those in a hatchery and then turn them loose. At least in the hatchery, the explorers are pretty much, that's there's competition amongst their mates and the ones that, you know, there's no predators, the ones that are more explorers, that are more bold, that are running around, those are the ones that are probably going to survive because they're racing to the food and they're going to be fed more. Whereas the, the ones that are the non-explorers, they probably don't compete as well. But then when they get turned into the wild, these fish have never seen predators. So all of a sudden, those ones that are explorers and just run around all the time, they may be the ones that are just eaten up. And we, you hear those stories of when they take hatchery-raised fish, turn them loose in a lake, and how they just, you know, these naive fish are just completely wiped out by the resident fish. They're like, wow, look at these ones just came off the turnip truck or the, the hatchery truck. In this case, they said it may be we're raising hatchery fish that are more of those explorers that are going to get eaten really quickly. We may need to look at how we take these hatchery fish, train them a little bit differently so they survive is going to be better when we turn them loose in the wild. So as a fisherman, to me, when I see these results, I find it interesting that bass definitely have personality traits. And just like people, uh, some people are more risk averse. Some people want to jump out of airplanes and, and parachute out or go zip lining across crazy canyons and stuff or bungee jumping. Same with fish. But the, the way that it translates to how they act and how they feed is a little bit different. So you wonder how these fish find it out to the middle lake. It kind of shows here some of these fish are true explorers. And you wonder in the wild if they're always roaming, if they're always on the look for areas out in the middle of the lake where grass starts growing, where shad are showing up, where other fish aren't living. They're always exploring where other ones are more homebodies and pretty much like, I'm good, dude. I found a good place to live. I'm going to spend my entire life here next to this one brush pile. I'm good as long as there's food here. And then the other thing, it just shows how complex this is, where some fish are more aggressive, roam more. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily translate to how they bite, though. And with those individual personality traits, they broke them into two pretty basic buckets here, but you saw how they diverge very quickly uh, based on explore or not and what they ate or not. I'm sure you can break them into tons of different personalities. And it's kind of like you know humans. Think of how many personality traits we have, characteristics, how you might describe someone as a thrill seeker but they're a pessimist or an optimist there's all sorts of you know character traits and personalities that you break them out to this kind of tells me pretty quickly here there's no magic bait no magic color that when you find a school of fish yeah a lot of them are going to react to it but at the same time there's tons of other ones that are saying, man, that thing's just too bright of a color. I don't like those loud rattles. It's too flashy. Something more subtle, something going slower is going to work better for me. I think the big takeaway to me as a fisherman that even if fish are in the same areas or on the same pattern, if I'm fishing a deep school, I want to, I want to trade it up and, and mix it up. I'm going to try, if I've caught a lot of fish on something, I'm going to try a more flashy bait, a less flashy one, something that's louder, something that goes faster or slower. I think you can try different lures and get them to pay off in the same area. By the same token, when you think you have a pattern and you're like, man, this is going pretty well, this kind of leads you to why so many times in tournaments, one guy's like, dude, I'm on a topwater pattern. I run the backs of creeks. They're schooling back there. It's awesome. Another guy's in the top 10 who's almost beating him. He's fishing brush piles out in the, the front of uh, coves and deeper water. And somebody else is fishing boat docks in between. There's lots of different things going on all the time. And no matter how convinced you are, you're on the right pattern. There's going to be different lures, different colors, different techniques, different things going on. So even when you're not catching them, there's tons of fish doing tons of different things. It's basically a matter of figuring out the fish that's in the right mood to eat your bait.
And speaking of picking out the right color, using the right sound to attract bass, what they're drawn to, check out more of my science playlist, tons of videos showing research studies and what they mean for bass fishing.